welcome. Welcome. Welcome to First Parish Unitarian Universalists of Arlington. We choose. We choose. We choose to be. A liberal religious community. Welcoming. Welcoming. Welcoming to all. We encourage each other on our spiritual journeys. Support one another through the changes in our lives and challenge the excesses and injustices of our time. Called to love, to love, to love, and upheld by joy. We live our faith. Good morning, friends. I'm David Whitford one of the volunteer worship associates at First Parish. Whenever we gather in worship, in person or online, we bring our joys and sorrows, shared and unshared, into our time of prayer, our time of communal engagement with the sacred, however we perceive the mystery. I invite you to settle your body, both feet on the floor if that feels comfortable, shoulders relaxed, head down, perhaps, hands gently clasped at your core or open to the infinite. Settle into softness, attend to grace, and breathe. In and out, in and out, in and out. Spirit of life, we beseech you on the threshold of a new pandemic year. Already more than five million lives lost worldwide. More than 830,000 in the United States alone. 20,000 in Massachusetts, 4,000 in Middlesex County, 90 in Arlington. Face to face with a pandemic reality that reminds us again and again that planning is presumptuous. Certainty is an illusion. Life is precarious. What are we to make of this? What are we to understand? How do we respond? What are we called to create? Holy Spirit, we beseech you in the wake of the warmest December day ever recorded in Alaska, 67 degrees, in the ashes of winter wildfires in Colorado, shocked by newspaper headlines that call to us as if from Armageddon, cities swallowed by dust, human history drowned by the sea, economies devastated, lives ruined. What are we to make of this? What are we to understand? How do we respond? What are we called to create? We beseech you on the one year anniversary of January 6th. We remember those who died on that gray winter day and in the dark days that followed the victims of physical violence and the victims of emotional trauma. What are we to make of this? What are we to understand? How do we respond? What are we called to create? Spirit of life, come unto us, hold in our hearts all the stirrings of compassion. For suffering innocents swept up in civil war in Ethiopia and geopolitical conflict in Afghanistan. For the 12 victims of the Philadelphia Row House fire, all one family, three sisters and their sons and their daughters. For those among us with aging parents, for those among us with troubled children, 
or anyone who could use a listening ear, a loving heart, or a helping hand. Spirit of life, be with us at home and in the wider world as we seek to understand, as we are moved to respond, as we are inspired to create. Please join me in two minutes of silent prayer. I'd like to I'd like to dedicate this morning's message to the memory of my mom who would have celebrated her 104th birthday today. Happy birthday, mom. The woman is in her mid 40s. Her husband 10 years her senior. They have been married for about 15 years. To all appearances, they lead an enviable life. Accomplished writers both, they are successful, well-connected, socially engaged, and supportive of one another's careers. One evening over dinner, the woman playfully suggests that there could be more passion in their relationship. Silent for just a moment, the man tells his wife he's having an affair then gets up and leaves. It was as if, she told me, everything around her, the world itself, had begun to collapse, as if her world were falling apart. Not far away, a young man is driving north on the interstate. His cell phone rings and his attention is diverted for just a moment. He checks the caller ID, and decides the call can wait. When he looks back to the road, though, all he can see filling the entire windshield is the big back end of a semi-trailer, his car seconds away from disaster. Fear takes control of his entire body. He only recalls the next few moments in fragments from a dream the car breaking hard, the tires screeching, the car in nether time turning in slow motion, stopping at last half buried in a snowbank piled high in the center median. Fear had taken provisional control of his actions and brought him to safety. Shortly before his death, Mark Twain mused, I am an old man, and I have known a great many troubles, but most of them never happened. This quip points to another kind of fear, apprehension of things that may or may not take place. I think we can all agree there is no shortage of frightening developments and situations all around us. Viral surge <clears throat> just when we thought we were getting ahead of this. Mounting social unrest, a near national assault on voting rights. The climate crisis, supply chain woes, inflation, the ongoing immigration nightmare. The rise of authoritarianism around the world unstoppable gun violence, growing radical extremism, conspiracy theorists gaining ground, isolation in all of its attendant worries. There are moments, there are moments when I hardly recognize the world I grew up in, and it, it frightens me. As I say, there is no shortage of things that can cause us to feel fearful. Last week, I received an email from an old friend who moved to Sacramento about five years ago, Jeff. He writes, 
If two years ago you had told me that I would volunteer our garage to serve as a centralized storage area for our co-housings, co-housing communities reserve COVID supplies, I'd have told you you were crazy. Well, Kev and I just finished stocking half the back wall of the garage, floor to ceiling, with paper products, gloves, bleach, alcohol. Now we're building shelves to store surplus canned and dry goods. This form of fear is best known as worry. In his book, Freedom from Fear, the Reverend Forrest Church tells us that, quote, worry grows in direct proportion to how little influence we have or feel we have over what may happen in the future. The word worry stems from the Anglo-Saxon root meaning strangle or choke. How can we break worry's stranglehold and keep it from choking us? Perhaps we might begin by loosening our own grip on the other end of the noose. Over time, we may see that the things we've been worrying about, sometimes dreading, don't occur, and that helps. But here's the thing. The energy I have spent worrying about what might happen tomorrow could have been used today to pay more attention to the people in my life today, this very moment, and the work that needs my attention today. Too often, things that may or may not feed our fears, when we could be focusing on the life that is ours this very moment. French novelist and critic Marcel Proust observed that only that which is absent can be imagined. Whenever we worry about something that might happen to us, we can be assured of only one thing. It does not exist. It is absent. The very thing we're fretting over poses no threat, for it does not exist. There's also the kind of fear that is sometimes hard to recognize, especially if the end result is helpful. Reverend Church names guilt as such a fear. He proposes that guilt is the most even-handed of fears. On the one hand, our conscience can paralyze us for no good reason. On the other, it can force us to change our lives for the better. When we have done something truly bad, guilt, though often first expressed as the fear of getting caught, works on behalf of our better selves. On such occasions, not only do we deserve pangs of guilt and the fear that comes with them, but such fear can actually awaken us to moral opportunity. And let's distinguish between this healthy guilt and its dysfunctional twin, a guilt that colors all we do, grows into a fear that is as crippling as it is unnecessary. And guilt can burrow in more deeply by convincing us to lie, to protect our secrets, hide our shame, Things may go better with coke, but guilt goes better with secrets and lies. When we lie to protect our secrets, we become more isolated and alienated from the very family members and friends who could help absolve our guilt by forgiving us. This helps explain how guilt flourishes in the darkness. Once we can own whatever it is that's causing the guilt, once we shine a light on it, fear loses so much of its grip. To err is human, 
And yet many of us place a very high value on perfection. Perfectionism in psychology is the belief that perfection can and should be attained. Right? The dark side of perfectionism is the belief that anything less than perfect, well, is unacceptable. The moral perfectionist lives in constant fear because moral perfection lies beyond our grasp. And perfectionism unchecked can become a form of self-abuse. One of the personal myths that still shapes my self-understanding, my relationship with others, and how I behave in the world has to do with perfection. I'm still coming to term with my own insecurities and, and fear of failure. I grew up in a family where nothing short of perfection was expected, for better or worse. This is a theme that continues to resurface as a growing edge in my ministry. And that panel of judges in my mind can be so unforgiving. Part of ministry is always risking failure and quite possibly never satisfying everyone. Intellectually, I understand that if I cannot accept my own limitations and shortcomings, it will be very difficult, if not plain impossible, to accept or offer forgiveness to others. My challenge comes in moving the understanding from the head to the heart so that when I'm confronted by my limitations, I can accept them and perhaps even use them as a way of relating and connecting to others. There's a, a Gary Larson cartoon I've always loved. Two elderly Larson-esque women are standing behind a locked door peeking out the window at a monster standing on their doorstep. One of the women is saying to the other, Calm down, Edna. Yes, it is a giant hideous insect, but it may be a giant hideous insect in need of help. Fear happens. Fear is a part of being alive, and we can't, cannot make it look pretty. If we didn't feel fear, we wouldn't know when we were in true danger. Fear is a universal reaction against the possibility of, of loneliness, of death, of not having anything to hold on to. Fear happens. And what will be our response? Often our singular reaction to change to being reminded that we are not in control is anger. Often our initial response to fear is anxiety. Often our gut reaction is just to shut down. But as meaning-making, world-creating beings, we can choose from a near-infinite variety of human responses on how, how, to deal with fear. Unlike the animal world, the human world is open to possibility, not closed. Other animals enter the world with a very specialized, firmly directed drives. As a result, they live in worlds that are more or less determined by instinct. The animal world is closed in terms of possibilities, programmed, as it were, by its very constitution. The mouse lives in a, in a mouse world. The horse lives in a horse world. There is no human world in this sense. As humans, as choice-making, meaning-making creatures, we live in a world that is unprogrammed. And we fashion this world by the choices we make. In the first half of his book, Reverend Church dissects fear. He breaks fear down into more manageable ideas. 
He discusses fright and insecurity and guilt and dread. In the book Second Half, he offers various antidotes, many of which seem to draw on Buddhist philosophy. To answer fear's best arguments, he counsels, three strategies commend themselves. As easy to remember as they may be difficult to accomplish, each nonetheless lies fully within our power. Reverend Church counsels this, doing what we can, wanting what we have, being who we are. Do what you can, want what you have, be who you are. Yes, Edna, it is a giant, hideous insect, but it may be a monster in need of help. Lighten up, Edna. Where is that helpful, easygoing Edna I've known all my life? Where's your sense of curiosity? Doing what we can focuses our mind on what is possible, nothing more or less. Right now, it feels as if the ground is shifting with each passing moment of the day. And each moment becomes an opportunity. Wanting what we have diminishes the desire for what we don't have. Even if what we've been given today happens to be a giant hideous insect in need of some TLC, even if what we have been given today is a pandemic in need of containment. And being who we are, not who we wish we were, not who our parents were, not who our loved ones think we are, being who we are, accepting who we are is the beginning of accepting others as they are. Being who we are implies that we know who we are. And there's nothing quite like not knowing how our situations may change tomorrow to help us understand our innermost desires, our motivations, and sometimes our very well-masked fears. Please remember that to live, to live is to know fear. It is part of our human condition. The philosopher Kierkegaard said to venture, to venture causes anxiety, but not to venture is to lose oneself. So to some extent, we all need to know fear to find our, to find our place in the world. Anything we do in life, any risk we take, any relationship we enter causes anxiety. Will it work? Am I good enough? Am I an asymptomatic carrier? Human beings have been living with anxiety from, since the dawn of history. Ever since our ancestors saw that saber-toothed tiger lurking over the next hill, looking for dinner, we have been anxious about life and limb. Where would we live? Where would our next meal come from? But we also come equipped with skills and smarts, the skills and smarts to deal with these anxious moments. We learned to sweat so that we would be slippery in another's grasp and get away. And we are often fast enough to do so or clever enough to hide. We found and find ways to survive and flourish. That's what we do. In fact, we know that sometimes anxiety can help spur us on to action. So if you're feeling fearful, if you are feeling afraid, please know you are not alone. You may even consider yourself lucky, and, and, and this is where courage comes in. The courage to do what we can, to want what we have, and to be just who we are. Yes, courage. Various religious philosophies encourage us to seek the spiritual path by befriending fear. Psychiatrist Tom Rutledge 
offers a strategy based on working with, working with our fears instead of against them. He explains that we mustn't work to banish fear, which is impossible, but instead to learn how to differentiate between healthy fear and unhealthy fear. Healthy fear, Rutledge tells us, can offer guidance, support, wisdom, and encouragement when we need it the most. But to accept it, we must first stop running from it. It's a choice that runs counter to some of our deepest instincts. And yet, if we can accept that we are not in control and also recognize that none of us is alone, that we are all in this together, then perhaps, then perhaps we can open our hearts to compassion instead of fear. If we can accept that change, impermanence, and at times upheaval are natural and necessary parts of creation, then we might more easily meet the unknown with less resistance. The trick is to keep exploring, to keep curious and not bail out. Even when we find out that things are not what we thought, Nothing, nothing is what we thought. Once we stop living in this illusion of permanence, stop believing that our time is unlimited, that it could never happen to us, we might more fully appreciate the time we actually have as the gift that it is. The fact is, we don't know how much time we have, do we? Compassion matters today. Accepting the impermanence of our lives can help us bump elbows with our fears and learn to live more fully, more meaningfully, more courageously in the face of fear. Blessed be.